Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on making sense of the hysteria of COVID-19, a human factors perspective for vascular access professionals. I'm Judy Thompson, the Director of Education at the Association for Vascular Access, and we're broadcasting today from our socially distant COVID-free cave. Kinda. I'm joined today by Blake Hotchkiss, who is assisting with AVA Education and will be fielding your questions today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Hudson Garrett is the president and CEO of the Community Health Associates, LLC, and has a faculty appointment as an adjunct assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. He also co-founded the nonprofit, the Infection Prevention Institute, to help shepherd dissemination of best practice of infection prevention and control across the healthcare continuum of care globally. Hudson holds a graduate certificate in infection prevention and infection control. He's board certified in patient safety and infection prevention and control. And in addition, he has completed the John Hopkins Fellows Program in hospital epidemiology and infection control. He is a frequent international lecturer in the areas of infectious diseases, healthcare associated infections, and infection prevention and control. Dr. Garrett has lectured in more than 25 company, um, companies as well, but countries, and given testimony to the government and regulatory agencies on a variety of topics related to infectious disease. And new to our AVA family is Sean Kaufman. For over 25 years, Sean has worked to minimize human risk factors within the workplace environment by controlling for interactions between human behavior and environmental conditions. Before leading his own organization, Sean has served at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. His tenure at both organizations, or during his tenure, Sean has responded to several emergency situations, including 9-11, anthrax attacks, Ebola, H1N1, and SARS, for which he was awarded two Health and Human Distinguished Service Awards. Sean is a behavioral expert who understands the risks of being human. He has served many organizations and assisted in controlling apathy, complacency, perceived mastery, and unconscious incompetence. I can't wait to hear more about that one. All noted human risk factors, regardless of where you are in the world and what industry you serve. So without further ado, Hudson, Sean, take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Judy, and good afternoon to each of you that have joined us. I know several of you were on our first webinar that we did, and in conversations with Judy, we wanted to have sort of a second series to A, bring you updated information about the current pandemic, but also add a different level of complexity to the conversation, which is how do we deal with this from a healthcare provider and resiliency standpoint and really address the human capital aspect? So you can see our objectives for today are to really look at both current and future implications to vascular access. We want to really model the best behavior and looking at some behavioral modifications that might be necessary when dealing with PPE. And then lastly, what can we do to plan for the future? I think that's such a really important piece of this is that we can't just look at this as a COVID-19 situation, but more importantly, we need to look at this moving forward. As always, uh, for a quick disclaimer, all the most up-to-date information is available on the CDC website, and we also refer you to check with your local health department guidelines for specific guidance for your uh, individual geographies. So what do we want to do with our time today? Well, as we talked about last time, we want to make sure you're safe. We want to make sure the patient is safe. We want to sort of demystify, which is really the theme of today, some of the hysteria. There's some good information out there. There's some bad information. There's some sort of, sort of true information, if you will. And then lastly, look at some rational and pragmatic approaches to make sure we can mitigate this outbreak, not just today, but again for the future. So what is the government doing right now? Well, this is a pretty loaded question as we're all familiar, but uh, this is pretty much a very collaborative approach with CDC, FDA, EPA, um, a variety of different agencies, HHS, of course. And, and one of the most important things to note since our last webinar is this high throughput uh, capacity for rapid diagnostics. We'll talk about testing uh, a little bit later in the program, but this was something that was not available in the private sector when we, when we talked to you last. The other thing that's really promising, and you've probably seen it on the national news, is a lot of the public-private partnerships. You know, organizations like GM are stepping up, offering to make ventilators. And while some of this will take time with some of the regulatory hurdles, it's a great thing to see that the country is sort of rallying together to help produce some of these vitally needed medical supplies. 
We've also seen a commission in production of new PPE, and we were very familiar with sort of the challenges with this. Many healthcare facilities have run out of PPE, are close to running out, or in some cases making their own PPE. And so this is something that Sean will talk about and some of the things that we can do to protect ourselves, but also sort of protect our brains from burnout. And then lastly, there's additional federal support that's coming through FEMA, the Department of Defense, and Health and Human Services. So there's a lot of stuff going on, and this is pretty much a moving target. So I wanna go back to, again, what's that risk profile for this particular pandemic? And again, overall, it's pretty low. So if you're normally healthy, you don't have a lot of comorbidities, then the mortality and morbidity for this is, is pretty low. We do recognize, however, and Sean will talk about his perspective on this here shortly, but we recognize that there's a group of people that are very vulnerable, people that we need to think about with their comorbidities. And then of course, us as healthcare professionals are gonna interact with known or suspected or not even suspected patients that might be symptomatic. When we first launched the, the program with Judy, we had sort of that general travel advisory with China and some of the other places. And of course, now with community spread taking on uh, a new sort of uh, pathway in the US, this is something that's a rapidly changing target. So what is the current status? Uh, right now, we're close to 350,000 cases. We've got about 15,000 deaths. And in the U United States, we're at about 35,000 cases with 471 deaths as of the 23rd. Um, again, this information is updated usually twice a day on the CDC website. And you can also look at it live with the John Hopkins map, which should be coming up on your screen here in just a second. Um, this is my favorite map because I'm, I'm a visual person. I like to be able to see. And it gives us not only real-time information about the total number of cases, but one of the numbers that I think the media especially has not focused on is the total number of recovered patients, which you see on the right. And so again, when we look at sort of the attack rate and the mortality and morbidity with this, we need to put that in perspective of the total number of cases versus the total number of deaths, but also the people that have completely recovered past their incubation time period. And again, the web link is available for you down there um, if you'd like to go and visit that. But we also want to remind ourselves that we need to go to factual sources of information. This is something that's really, really important for us. There's a lot of misinformation out there, especially on social media, and we need to sort of dispel some of those myths that exist. So how are these patients gonna present? Well, again, we've got some classic symptoms, but we're gonna add some new symptoms today. We had previously talked about the traditional fever, cough, and shortness of breath, but now we're learning that there's some additional things that might be added to this sort of clinical presentation of these patients, things like diarrhea or GI upset. Um, this is something that is, has been demonstrated in the literature, especially in other countries with this sort of fecal shedding of this. That incubation time period is estimated between two and 14 days, as we talked about before. And there are some of those less common symptoms like cough with sputum production or sore throat or headache. Again, not every patient will present the same way. And so it's important that we risk stratify these patients, make sure we take the appropriate type of isolation precautions if indicated, and not every single patient that presents with respiratory illness will be indicated to get an actual COVID test. You know, we've got very limited resources and even patients that are asymptomatic, there's really not a lot of benefit of testing these patients because it's not gonna necessarily change the treatment um, as we stand today. So that case fatality information, lots of people had questions on this. So I wanted to hit on this again, that when we sort of stack up our comorbidities, medically speaking, we're gonna increase that risk for death um, or some type of permanent dysfunction. But the general case fatality rate in the US is very, very low. And so we do wanna carve out, if you will, the people that have those comorbidities that are increased risk, um, they doing some of the, the sort of uh, public health interventions like social distancing. So this past Saturday, I, I, had, to, uh, I had to work um, clinically and I went into a nursing home to uh, get a patient that they thought was septic. And I went around the corner and I found about 150 residents that were all congregated together in one little hallway, just packed and packed and packed like sardines. And so when we think about the impact in the long-term care settings, the acute care settings, and even the home care settings and some of these personal care homes, we really need to be very cognizant of, are we actually distancing ourselves to make sure that we can um, afford the amount of space that we need to try to stop the transmission? Regarding hospitalizations, the most um, common chief complaint with these patients, again, is pneumonia. Um, and we're seeing some acute respiratory distress syndrome um, that's developing in many of these patients requiring ventilation. If we look at all the news reports that have unfortunately come out of Italy, 
um, they have massive issues with respiratory surprise right now. So it's not just PPE, but it's even homemade ventilators. Um, you know, never did I think we'd have the conversations of splitting ventilators between multiple patients. But there are unique ways that are pretty ingenious, MacGyver-like, if you will, that allow us to sort of use that same piece of equipment for multiple patients when we're in that situation. And while it's great that the government is commissioning the uh, production of new ventilators, we really need to be prepared for what might be worst case, but also be prepared for how to sustain this in the future. Moving along to diagnostic testing, this is really exciting. Um, when we talked about this previously, there was very limited capability for testing. And while the complete capability, you know, for everybody to get a test if they wanted one is still not there, it is certainly more widespread than ever before. Now that private laboratories, universities, and the private sector have been engaged, there is widespread availability of testing sites. And many public health agencies are putting in place restrictions, as they should, on who should be tested. If you're asymptomatic, for example, there may not be an indication for you to be tested yet. Um, if you're symptomatic and you're able to control those symptoms at home, it's probably better for you to stay home uh, if you don't have any comorbidities. Many of these patients will recover with no intervention. And again, when we look at the numbers going up daily, it's because we're doing more surveillance. We're looking for these patients. We're actually conducting these tests. But you notice that the mortality is actually going down, which is good. So as far as routes of transmission, this is where it gets a little bit sticky for vascular access, right? Because there's that person-to-person -person transmission. We know that there's sort of that um, six feet of space around us. We recognize that there's respiratory droplets that can be produced, and uh, you know that's why we always wanna wear respiratory protection. But one of the things that's been added to the mix is this evidence of fecal transmission, right? And the shedding in the feces. Um, I was talking to a colleague uh, over the weekend and she's actually one of the sites that's doing um, the actual rapid diagnostic testing. And she found that there was evidence of super shedders, people that are actually shedding the virus at extremely large levels. So their viral load is, you know, 10, 100, sometimes 100,000 times the viral load of other patients. And these people can actually contaminate others even when they're asymptomatic. So it's not good enough just to do screening, but we also want to make sure we take the appropriate respiratory precautions as we always should. The environmental transmission, there's been studies that have come out in the last two weeks about the survivability um, of this particular organism on environmental surfaces. And again, much of what we're talking about here is nothing new. It's stuff that we should always be doing from an infection control standpoint. And again, we wanna protect ourselves, the patient, the environment, as well as our equipment. And so in the, the world of vascular access, you've got an ultrasound machine, you might have a cart, you may be bringing in a sterile kit for your procedure. And these are all things that we need to think about in the context of what can I do to protect that surface transmission? And then more importantly, what can I do to protect myself? How can I cover my mucosal membranes? Um, if you don't have an N95, um, then you may have to use a surgical mask. If you don't have a surgical mask, you might have to make do with something else. Um, there's commercial pappers that are available as an example. You can make a mask. And CDC has put out some pretty controversial guidance about this uh, that's available on the web link there about what you can do if you completely run out of PPE. And again, I want to stress that this is if, you know, sort of worst case scenario. It is not something that we're advocating for general use, but if you run out of everything, then you have to make decisions that, you know, something is better than nothing. Um, and we want to make sure we, we sort of consider that. As far as the risk of transmission, while we know that most patients that are spreading are symptomatic, there is certainly evidence that there's people that are not symptomatic that are still able to spread, especially these super shedders, if you will. And community transmission um, has been occurring, and we'll go through a breakdown of that here in a second. So it's not just sort of that respiratory spread, but it's also what are we doing with our environmental surfaces? So for example, if you're completely out of disinfectant, but you have bleach, well, you can certainly make a one to 10 dilution of bleach. Um, if you don't have anything, then there may be other products like alcohol, which I think Sean's going to talk about in your actual healthcare setting that will afford you the opportunity to at least do something. Something, again, is better than nothing. And a lot of times with many of these organisms, uh, physical agitation of them can actually help remove them from the surface. Community spread is not something we like to talk about, but it, it is something that is a reality. So all 50 uh, states now have cases, but 27 states actually have documented community spread of COVID-19. Uh, this past weekend, I had to go to the grocery store to get a few things. And unlike many, I did not buy 100 rolls of toilet paper or anything like that. But I was amazed at sort of the hysteria um, in the community, not just with the actual customers, but with the employees of this particular grocery store. 
Some of them were wearing, um, you know, uh, face masks that they had made. I saw one person actually wearing a baby's diaper um, that he had sort of taped to his face. Um, I saw another individual that was wearing some type of sock that I think actually went on a golf club that he had put a hole in for his, his face. And so there's a lot of different activities that are taking place out there. And while community spread is certainly concerning, there's some great basic interventions that we can do, such as hand hygiene, staying home if we're ill, keeping people out of our facilities unless they're absolutely necessary to be there. Um, and, you know, you've got the social distancing thing, which, you know, in my opinion, is not going so well. Uh, I saw many, many people in my local community that were just out as if nothing was going on. And so it's really a matter of balancing the risk versus the benefit. When we look at those at-risk at populations, right, who are the people that are most vulnerable to this disease? Uh, certainly our older patients are huge here, but those that have significant comorbidities, especially lung disease, diabetes, hypertension, immunocompromised patients, if they're receiving oncology treatments, um, this is all something that we have to think about. Many of you may be involved in, in actually doing some type of infusion for these oncology patients, and we need to have a backup plan. What can we do to make sure they can continue to get those life-saving drugs while making sure we keep the other patients safe as well as the staff? So maybe staggering appointments, having an outpatient area where you can actually have a patient in every other room, um, using curtains as an example. There's lots of different things that we can do, but we need to think about continuity of care for these patients. And what are some of the things that we can do to make our PPE last longer, which Sean will talk about uh, later in the program. There are many basic things that we can do to mitigate risk. And, and I'd like to focus on a few of the most common, right? The first thing we can do is try to stay away from the exposure. Um, and that really means protecting ourselves. We are exposed to stuff every single day as healthcare professionals. We're exposed to infectious diseases, we're exposed to body fluids, you name it, we have exposures. And what we really want to try to do is not control the world, but control our reaction to the world. If we anticipate that we're going to have eye exposure, then wear eye protection. If we think that we have a respiratory pathogen, let's make sure we at least use, um, you know, uh, airborne precautions or droplet precautions. Um, we can stop visitors from coming into the facility. Um, and this is a very hard one right now. Uh, I ran into a patient's family earlier um, this weekend, uh, this past weekend, and it was very hard to see the, the loved one's reaction to the fact that they could not actually go in and visit. Um, I think that's something that's really, really hard that we have to think about the messaging and also think about how we as healthcare professionals can sort of be conduits to maintaining patient communication. Um, and Sean's got some great ideas about that. We can also put in place engineering controls, right? We can make sure that we sort of eliminate risk. We can engineer things into the process that will help us by putting barriers in place. And you know, one of the hot topics always is ensuring that our human resources teams are working with us to ensure that if we are ill, we are contagious, we're infectious, that we can stay home and be compensated for that. You know, so many healthcare workers work paycheck to paycheck. And it's really, really important that we have something in place, not just for COVID, not just for Ebola, but sort of the long-term philosophy of how do we take care of our own? How do we ensure that we make it easier to do the right thing by staying home? And part of that starts with us, right? As individual healthcare professionals, we have an obligation professionally. We have an obligation ethically to take care of our patients and ensure that we have the appropriate training. Um, one of the things, Judy, if you'd like, I'd like to go ahead and put that poll up. Um, about, you know, sort of the general awareness of where people are right now. So we'll go ahead and, and do that now. So our first question is, what's your current level of concern regarding caring for a COVID-19 patient? So we'll give everybody a, a few, few seconds to enter that. just wait until we get a little over 50% answering. Perfect. Thanks, Judy. Of course. Of course, of course. Okay, we're, again, we're looking the for your, your personal um, opinion, not your organization. So this is how you feel as a vascular access professional. Okay. Let's share these. Huh. Well, it looks like many people are, most of us, 60%. 77% are either very, very scared or somewhat concerned. Perfect. And then a small quarter percentage basically is neutral or not worried. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a pretty normal reaction to sort of, and again, the hysteria that's going around there. Um, hopefully you'll leave today with some ideas about different ways to approach sort of that fear. 
how do we mitigate that? And then more importantly, how do we build towards the future? Um, because with every outbreak comes an opportunity to learn, and with every opportunity to learn comes an opportunity to hardwire that process. So the last two things that you see listed here is what can we do with that whole clinical environment of care? As we talked about before, you've got an ultrasound machine, you might have a cart, you've got yourself, right, as sort of a living petri dish, and then you've got the patient's general environment in the room. So there's things that we can do, like basic disinfection and cleaning, ensuring we're using sterile barrier precautions. Um, and then, you know, probably the most important thing here is how do we collaborate with our infection preventionists and our public health authorities? Um, there's a lot of information that's out there. And while the number of cases is going up, again, does that really mean that there's any significance to that other than sort of the media uh, fear that they put out there? So there's a lot of things that we want to think about um, in terms of, of sort of messaging to our patients as well as to our coworkers. From a screening perspective, there are things that you can do to mitigate your risk, right? You can start with obtaining that travel history. Have they been outside of the country or in any specific city that might be a hot zone? Again, that changes every day. But one of the more important questions is, have you been exposed to someone that is known or suspected to have COVID-19? Um, and what I found is that many healthcare facilities are asking these questions, but they have no plan what to do when you say yes to any of them. So if I say, you know, or if I'm asked as a visitor, have I been exposed to COVID-19 and I check yes, there's really not a lot of follow-up, unfortunately. So we need to make sure that if we're gonna take action, if we're gonna ask these questions, that there's some type of protocol in place to handle each individual response that may come in. Those with symptoms, you know, we need to further evaluate them. Is this absolutely a vascular access procedure that needs to take place now? And if it is, do I have the right PPE to care for myself and for my patient? Um, you know, if you have something uh, that's a general, let's say a pick line insertion, and there's no anticipation for aerosol being generated, then a surgical mask may very well may be appropriate. And those are coming in the kits most likely anyway. But if you have a patient on a ventilator that may be producing aerosols or, or you're doing some type of NEV treatment or something like that at the same time, then that risk can go up. And so it's important to think about what can we do for ourselves, but what can we do from a source control standpoint to actually engineer out that risk um, from the patient? So if we're dealing with the patient, let's mask them. Um, if we're transporting a patient through the facility, let's make sure we mask them as well. And then once we get uh, sort of that patient contact, we want to use isolation rooms as much as possible. Those have run out. Um, I was at a local hospital here in Atlanta that has over 40 patients on isolation right now on one floor. Certainly, they don't have that many negative pressure rooms. Certainly, they don't have that many isolation carts. And so nurses and other clinicians are getting creative. They're, they're really doing sort of that tag team system to make sure that when they go in there, there's somebody spot checking them. When they come out, they're appropriately removing their PPE. They're still sort of maintaining that awareness toward hand hygiene. Right, And then we can look at how do we remind ourselves and our visitors about cough etiquette. Again, we can stop some of this transmission by basic interventions that we should have always done. When we focus on PPE, again, you know, wearing uh, gloves, if you are in sterile gloves, great. Um, that disposable isolation gown or coverall is acceptable. And again, much of this information or much of this equipment, if you will, is actually coming in your kits. The use of an IASH approved respirator, and there's a new FDA guidance out about this that's included on that link there that gives you other potential respirators that you can get access to that are not traditionally designed for healthcare. Eye protection is huge, right? If it's a mucous membrane and it's a, a wet uh, you know, fluid and it's not yours, you want to make sure it doesn't contact your mucosal membranes. This is huge. Um, and then, of course, there's evidence out there about the survivability of this in the air for up to three hours right now. So there's a lot of information that we could learn here. When we think about PPE, Sean's going to show some great sort of um, head to tail approaches, if you will, to actually put your PPE on and remove it. But we also want to make sure we dispose of it correctly um, without contaminating our coworkers. That's something that's really, really huge here. And there are many places that are unfortunately being uh, asked to reuse PPE. Um, you think about mask, if you're washing a mask, you may actually break down the sort of membrane that protects you. So it's important to follow the manufacturer's instructions and ensure that what you are doing, if you're reusing PPE, is still going to ensure um, that you can you know, reuse it safely. Respiratory wise, um, many, many facilities are out of N95s. Um, they're out of respirators altogether. Some facilities are going to a PAPR system if they have those. Think about maybe having a dedicated team that can care for these patients that are fit tested, that do have respirators, that do have a PAPR system. Um, and then ensure that every time that we're dealing with this and we're removing PPE that we're performing hand hygiene. 
Um, we cannot move away from this. I always go back to an old quote that a colleague at CDC said, which is, you know, if we just washed our hands when we should, about 80 to 90% of infections would just go away. Um, and that's something that really resonates very highly with me. There's also some great tools that have been launched on the OSHA website, um, specifically about respiratory protection that are interactive. And so if you're not familiar with some of the tools and tricks out there, OSHA is a great place to go um, to start that. When we're dealing with respirators, again, our, what our sort of goal here is, is prevent transmission, right? The droplet size is different, and we wanna ensure that these respirators are appropriately fit tested. Uh, I was working with a colleague this past weekend, she's pretty small and petite, and she had a respirator that didn't fit, and it literally covered her, almost her entire face. And so it's equally important not only to have the PPE, but to ensure that it's actually gonna fit appropriately and then it's gonna fit within our respiratory protection program. So what are some things that we can do? Well, if we don't have access to PPE, we might have to make our own. Um, and again, there's new FDA and CDC guidance out there that's gonna help you do that. I'm hopeful and very optimistic that with the commissioning and some of the, the great companies like 3M and others that are stepping up to the plate to build more masks, that this will sort of um, correct itself over time. One of the things that I think is of, of concern, though, is that we're going to have large orders for a long period of time. So facilities are going to hopefully learn their lesson and say, well, maybe it's not a good idea to only keep 72 hours of supplies in house. Maybe we need to keep more than that. Our distributing partners like our McKessons and Medlines and Cardinals of the world are probably going to do the same thing and have a bigger safety stock. And we also recognize that, um, you know, there's there's the public perception that if I walk down the street, I need to wear a mask. So let's go to the next poll, Judy, um, on PPE supply, and let's get a quick um, accounting, if you will, of where everybody is um, with their facility. So Judy, if you can pull up that next poll, that'd be great. Absolutely. Now the question is, is what's your current PPE situation at your facility? And we'll give you a, a minute just to go ahead and enter that, and let's see where everybody is. Oh, we should have added, we we have very low supplies or reusing, but next time. Okay, we're going to close this poll and share the results with you. 55% are running very low. Another 6% are out. 26% of you have got doing well. So that's where we need to go. We need to come raid your hospital. So, you know, if you're in that category, if you have a good supply, then awesome for you. Uh, many are not. And I've got several colleagues that work in anesthesia that are currently unemployed right now because their facilities have canceled all elective procedures. And we want to think about, is this a procedure that's medically necessary now? If so, can we do it maybe in a negative pressure room or a procedure room that has good ventilation? Um, to sort of limit that risk. Do we have N95s or surgical masks? Um, you know, if, if the vascular access kits from the manufacturers run out, what might we do? Um, so these are all things that we need to think about when caring for these patients that require that aggressive vascular access support. Eye protection, I think we forget about all the time. Um, I, I myself am bad about this, but I, I try to be good. And right now I wear eye protection on every single patient. Um, it just has become part of sort of my habit. Um, and that can be the form of goggles, which are great because you can disinfect and wipe those down. The face shields are great if you can get access to those as well, but regular eyeglasses alone are not something that's gonna be helpful. So you wanna make sure that you remove that eye protection when you leave the patient's environment. And lastly, um, there's been lots of emphasis on aerosol generating procedures. Um, and again, if we have something that's gonna generate aerosols, the recommendation again is to use that highest level of respiratory protection. There's different ways to accomplish that. Um, but the reality is this should be a pretty low um, incidence in the vascular access space, I would anticipate. So you can always work with your infection preventionist to determine what the risk might be. What are some of the steps that you can take? Or there's some dedicated procedure rooms that have good ventilation with good turnover. There's lots of different things that we can do to mitigate some of that risk here. And then additionally, think about that full um, barrier precaution, right? We can put source control on that patient by masking them. We can also cancel elective procedures as we talked about before. So these are all things that are difficult conversations to have, but healthcare leaders and administrators have to have these conversations. It's really important. And then as we finish up with some of the information, I, I again wanted to remind us of environmental infection control recommendations. There is an ever-changing list that the EPA maintains um, about products that are effective against COVID-19. 
So you can always refer to that list, see if the disinfectant that you have that's already EPA registered is on there. Um, and that information is very, very helpful for facilities to determine, hey, do I even have the right stuff here? And then frankly, what do I do if I run out of those commercial products? Um, can I make my own disinfectant? What chemicals might I have access to in bulk that will allow me to still disinfect my high touch surfaces? Um, and, and also we wanna think about that, that ultrasound machine. Um, and this is an area of focus that Judy and I both had for several months working on a, the little guidance document that we're putting out. But you know, we wanna ensure that we can actually disinfect that equipment without damaging it long-term and voiding that manufacturer's warranties. And then last is hand hygiene, right? I can't stress this enough. An alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water is hugely helpful. Soap and water by itself is great. Um, and again, if we have visibly soiled hands, we wanna go back to the use of soap and water. It's gonna give us our best possible outcome. We don't wanna smear it around, we wanna remove it. So as we finish up um, with my piece, there's some other steps to consider, right? We can have face masks at facility entrances, which you wanna make sure you do this carefully, because if not, they'll walk away, they'll sprout legs and they'll disappear. We can ask screening questions. We can do this when we go into a patient um, to ensure. I would never rely on someone else asking these questions. I would always ask the question again. I'd rather the patient frankly be mad at me and say, well, I've been asked this 10 times and yet I get a different answer. Um, and so these are all things that we need to take personal responsibility for um, to do that. And then if we've got things like doors that are open, why not close them? Why not exercise a little bit of common sense and say, let's keep the respiratory pathogens in their room and out of our hallway. Um, so these are some basic things that we can do. And then Sean's gonna talk a little bit about this hierarchy of controls, um, which I think is fascinating. There's things like PPE, which you'll see at the very bottom of the chart, meaning they're least effective. And there's things at the top, like how can we physically remove um, the hazard itself? From a treatment standpoint, there are new updates. Um, again, some of this is controversial, but I've listed the three available um, treatments. Some of these are under the Compassionate Use Act through the FDA. Um, you will notice that on the national news, uh, like Teva, for example, donated some supplies, which was very, very generous of them. And there's also some additional things that are going through the FDA right now. One of the other things that I mentioned on the last program that I wanted to reinforce was the use of corticosteroids um, has been seen to actually prolong viral replication. And so this is something we want to avoid. And the last two things I wanted to go over with you was something that many of you asked on the last presentation and I wanted to make sure I provided you a resource for. So several of you asked, what should I do if? Um, and some of those if questions were, what if I walk into a room and I'm only wearing gloves and I'm exposed? Or what if I'm wearing gloves and a gown, but no respirator? Or what if I'm wearing gloves, gown and a respirator, but no eye protection? And so these two charts actually tell you if you've had prolonged close contact with a COVID-19 patient, who is wearing a face mask, right? So that's the first piece. And you'll notice that it gives you the exposure category, whether it's low, medium, or high. It tells you what the recommended monitoring is for, for that exposure. And then what, if any, work restrictions. And so you'll notice that several of these say no work restrictions. So it's important that your facility's occupational health team is looking at this carefully. And the second one is somebody who is not wearing a face mask, which of course is a more high risk event. Um, and you'll see the same thing. So I wanted to make sure that we covered that. Um, and Judy's got these posted on the right side of the screen for you to download. This helps us really look at this objectively. We take some of the fear out of this equation and more importantly, it allows us to say, what do we really need to do? If we quarantine every single healthcare worker that's exposed, guess what? We're not gonna have any healthcare workers. And so it gives us a more objective approach. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean, who's going to go over some of the more human capital aspects of this. I can't say how excited I am enough. Um, uh, Judy and Sean and I had a conversation last week about what do we do next? How can we actually prepare the AVA membership and the vascular access professional for what's coming and specifically what they can do to protect themselves from the future? So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hudson. I really appreciate it. And wow, I, I, I also appreciate the chance to, to be able to talk to so many individuals serving on the front lines out there. All of you are heroes. And I truly, truly, again, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to serve you. Uh, my, my interest, and I have to give a, a great amount of, uh, of appreciation. Uh, my background is in infectious disease and behavior. And the reality of it is, is that I never really truly knew that our skill subsets uh, are, would actually complement one another, meaning 
in 2004, I had an opportunity to start working with scientists who work in high containment labs. That would be BSL-3 and BSL-4, things like anthrax, Ebola, and you name it, we work with it. And being a behaviorist, we run a simulation training lab. And now for 10 years, I dabbled in healthcare. There was no doubt. We taught nurses and doctors how to wash their hands and remove their gloves without contaminating their hands. But in 2014, I was honored by being asked to, to uh, evaluate the Emory University Isolation Unit for Ebola and, uh, and to determine whether or not doctors and nurses were ready to, to treat the first two Ebola patients. And it was during that experience that I learned that there is so much that we can do together and so much we can teach each other. Uh, it's two professions, biosafety and infection control, literally running parallel to one another, and they can truly learn from each other. And so I want to share with you some concepts about what I call clinical containment and, uh, and why these, uh, these lessons are so important. As a result of 2014, uh, I did just recently, with the help of the American Society for Microbiology, publish and write a book. It actually came out in February before all of this COVID-19 stuff started. And it really truly talks about a blend of uh, techniques and strategies for healthcare workers um, and lots of lessons, over 25 years of experience in responding to several different emerging infectious disease outbreaks, many of which could help with this outbreak in particular. But that book, if you do search it on Google, it is available. And I would strongly recommend it because again, it's, it really truly aims to prepare what I call infectious disease pioneers. These are the individuals that work on the front lines of emerging infectious diseases. And I do have strong opinions. Unfortunately, I believe that, uh, you know, having had the opportunity to work uh, with HIV and AIDS prior to protease inhibitors, meaning when you got the disease, it was really truly a, a death sentence at that point. The reality is, is that we have done or did a major overhaul uh, for bloodborne pathogens in the late 80s. Uh, meaning if you were born before the 80s, like myself, unfortunately, you were born into ungloved hands. Dentists would use, would use bare hands to work in patients' mouths. And the reality is, is that when the bloodborne pathogens, hepatitis B and HIV made a presence, the healthcare industry changed its practices to protect its workers. Well, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the truth is, is that with emerging infectious diseases that we see today, that we saw in 2014 with Ebola, that we saw in 2003 and 4 with SARS, the original SARS, emerging infectious diseases is giving us a warning. They're sounding the alarm. The healthcare industry has got to do more to face threats like emerging infectious diseases like this COVID-19 because we're very fortunate that even though this disease seems to like us equally, meaning it seems to love us as a host, the reality is, is it doesn't treat us fairly. It's a bully. It's picking on people who I call VIPs or vulnerable immunocompromised persons. And, and believe it or not, I think VIPs is a good term because we can say these are our VIPs and treat them like very important people. But the reality is, is that this is a bully. It picks on people in an, in an unfair fashion. And if you have any conditions, uh, pre-existing comorbid conditions, diabetes, heart disease, respiratory diseases, uh, over the age of 60, get ready. This virus is a bully and can and does pick on you. So the reality is, is that that's what this, uh, this book is about. It's again, a combination of infection control and biosafety. We see Florence Nightingale. She talks about the first requirement of a hospital is that it should do the sick no harm. And unfortunately with over 1.2 million healthcare associated infections each year and over 100,000 deaths in the United States, it's not about whether infection control works. We know it works but it's about can we improve infection control and can we complement it with existing technologies and strategies to make it better? And I believe the answer is yes. I work with several hospitals and I'll give you a classic example. When I walk into a clinic and somebody says, that's a high risk patient, 
immediately I'm thinking, why aren't we wearing personal protective equipment? Why aren't we doing this? And the nurses and doctors say to me, no, 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 Sean, no, no. When I say high-risk patient, I'm talking about the fact that the patient is, is, you know, has a compromised immune system. And I'm thinking, well, hold on one sec. Listen, the one thing that infection control does is it makes the patient the primary, primary focus. And that is what's very, very different with infection control and biosafety. In biosafety, the primary focus is the workforce. So when you say that's a high risk patient, you're, you're saying in context that that patient is high risk to you, that you better take precautions to protect yourself from that high risk patient, not that the patient is at high risk for a healthcare associated infection. See, I call those VIPs. Uh, and that is, again, a vulnerable, immunocompromised person. And that tells healthcare workers that this person needs added protection, not only from uh, the other patients they're around, but from our triage and how we work with them in our emergency departments and, and areas like that. So when we look at biosafety, we look at the fact that it's, it's workforce-centered. So I believe, I truly believe that Biosafety and infection control can be blended to create this thing called clinical containment. And that's the blending of biosafety and infection control strategies for the protection of the community, healthcare staff, and the patient. And so that's what this clinical containment concept is all about. Now, unfortunately, we face a lot of practices and challenges that we're already ingrained in. And let me explain this. For years, for years, we have known that influenza is droplet transmission. That means that when someone talks, they spit. And as they spit, they spit out over a six foot radius. And for some strange reason, even though we have been forewarned about this, forewarned, we continue to set up registration desks and triage desks. And I've even seen it with the COVID-19 disease here too, where we put our healthcare workers in a chair and ask people to come in, sometimes that are febrile, and register and talk. And as they talk, they spit over the surfaces of where our healthcare providers sit and where they are. Meaning infection control can use one of the greatest barriers in infectious disease, and that's called distancing. It also means elevation, where you can elevate someone so that gravity takes care of the droplets as well. In addition to that, you can use fans behind these individuals so that droplets can be controlled too. And instead of going in everybody's face or on their work surfaces, it's being pushed away from them. We see this, and this is a common thing that we see. We also go into emergency departments and ask patients that are febrile to sit next to people who need stitches, have broken arms, babies, all sorts of things. And in addition to that, ladies and gentlemen, we put food inviting people to put what's on their hands near their mouth. We give them magazines that they can touch. And so the reality is, is we're almost creating this blended cesspool before we even have a chance to treat the patients. And, and again, these are habits that will not and cannot continue when we're dealing with emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19. We also, unfortunately, have salad bars, but this is not the key issue. The big issue is when we see medical providers that deal with patients that are sick and febrile, they go to common eating areas with the same clothes that they see those patients with. And I can't tell you how many times I see in a cafeteria docs wearing booties and, and head covers from areas in the hospital. And again, this is something that we've got into a habit of that needs to be improved. And when we look at tough challenges and we look at the interaction with technology, with phones, stethoscopes, all of our equipment, I think endoscopes is a, a big issue as well. We have some really tough challenges in how we're going to ensure not only patient protection, but also how we're going to ensure provider protection as well. Now, when we talk about clinical containment, there are four primary controls of clinical containment. And each one of these primary controls are absolutely critical, meaning we never rely solely on one. We rely on all four. Let me explain what that is. The first is these engineering controls. Now that can be directional airflow, which you can pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for, or you can use fans, uh, hands-free sinks, autoclaves, self-closing doors. 
there's all sorts of things uh, that uh, that we do but typically engineering is a very expensive control it's a very expensive control. these are mechanical devices that are designed to keep what we're working with where we're working with it okay when we look at personal protective equipment we're looking at gloves eye protection respirator scrubs booties coveralls but let's remember what ppe is all about because when we have shortages of personal protective equipment we are going to have to become creative so let's remember what ppe does the first goal of personal protective equipment is to allow for us to leave what we're working with where we are working with it meaning there is no reason for you to be taking uh, your personal protective equipment uh, around people who aren't sick and what i mean by that is so often we'll see people interact with a sick person with ppe and then walk away and it's almost like it's the equivalent excuse me i'm gonna have to do this it's equivalent to stepping in a, a pile of dog poop and rather than removing your shoes to go get the items to clean up you choose to walk around everywhere with those shoes to go get the items to clean up you have to leave what you're working with where you're working with it that's number one but personal protective equipment also protects portals of entry, meaning we can have exposures, but if there's no way for the virus to get into our bodies, we are protected, meaning we must be able to protect our eyes, our nose, our mouth, and our cuticles, our cuticles around our fingertips. Because when we look at our fingertips, one of the reasons why we focus on glove removal, we've developed a technique called the beaking method, which we shared with Emory University, but you can go on YouTube and look up the Beaky Method. We also have, have all sorts of things posted on, um, on the YouTube channel. You're gonna see around your cuticle areas, cuts and tears. If you are removing your gloves and one hand is bare, when you go to remove the other glove, please consider looking at the Beaking Method. It's not good enough just to have personal protective equipment. You have to also take off your PPE properly. That means donning and doffing. You need to have plans for that. And again, if you're looking for good videos, you can go to Safer Behaviors. Just look up Safer Behaviors on YouTube and we're putting several videos on there. We'll be continuing. Dr. Hudson and I worked with some pretty good videos today uh, that are gonna focus on resiliency. They're gonna be a minute long. We're gonna focus on getting through this together. You need plans for needle sticks, for spills, how are you going to evacuate patients that are infectious if a fire occurs or you need to have a hospital evacuation? Waste management, how are you doing that? Each organization must have SOPs. And last but not least, we also have to have leadership. That includes training, surveillance programs. Listen, this is critical. When we talk about surveillance, we have not, you should know around you, you should know the number of people that are VIPs. We have healthcare workers on the front lines of emerging infectious diseases that are VIPs. And it's almost like we're daring, we're daring this disease to, to begin to kill healthcare workers. We've already lost, I mean, at last count that I saw uh, in one paper in China, we lost, there was a, a, a group of 70,000, it got cut down to 40,000. Within that 40,000, we had 30% of those infections were healthcare providers. And this is a, a JAMA article and we lost five healthcare providers died as a result of COVID-19. Again, if you have VIPs, that again is the vulnerable immunocompromised persons working on the front line of this emerging infectious disease, tell them to have a staycation. Do not let them continue to work because you're almost daring for this disease to bully them, all right? Again, remember, this disease loves us. It loves us equally, but it does not treat us fairly. And that is absolutely critical. It likes to pick on people with pre-existing medical conditions and, and, and we gotta do everything we can to protect our VIPs. Remember that engineering is about mechanical devices keeping the agent where we're keeping the agent. Now, I will tell you this, I'll give you a classic example of, of engineering and PPE and how we work in, 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 in aspects. During the Ebola aspect, I was asked by the nurses and doctors to stay and to watch over and manage the uh, the Ebola unit, the uh, the uh, the unit at Emory Healthcare, um, and and I wondered why I was doing that. And I remember Jill Morgan, my she was an all-star ICU nurse, uh, was looking at Dr. Brantley, and uh, she was touching some things, getting him undressed. She was doing her assessment, 
And she then began to walk away from Dr. Brantley. And I banged on the window and I reminded her to sanitize her gloves because we want to try and keep what we're working with as close to the patient as we possibly can. Touching the patient and then walking around areas without sanitizing gloves only allows for containment of, the, of, 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 of what the patient has to move around the room. And that's not what we want. So engineering keeps everything where it's supposed to be. The personal protective equipment is designed to protect portals of entry and allows for us to leave what we're working with behind so that when we move forward and away, we're working again from clean to dirty and from dirty to clean. There should never be a time where dirty and clean meet instantaneously. There should be a buffer. Consider it like a, a traffic uh, a stop sign, so to speak, where there's you know uh, green, yellow, and red. You have a green area, you have a yellow area, and you have a red area. And where people come and go, meaning when they come in and when they come out, there's that yellow area that, that provides us a buffer between green and red. So you should always think about how we use containment strategies of infectious disease in clinical settings to make things safer. If you look at this, this diagram here, this is actually the isolation unit at Emory University. And what I want to do is I want to show you how we donned and doffed. And these, these slides, I think, are absolutely critical because even though this is at the highest level, uh, this one's at the lowest risk. So when Dr. Brantley and, and Nancy Reibel, when they were, uh, what we found was no virus was found in their blood anymore. We couldn't detect it at, 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 uh, on the PCR aspects. What we were able to do was downgrade our donning and doffing gear. So, uh, so this is exactly what we would do. Uh, they would wear two pairs of gloves, uh, a gown, a face shield, and a mask, and booties. Now, this is very similar to what we're seeing now. And so this provides a SOP for how you want to don that gear, and it provides an SOP for how you want to doff that gear, okay? And again, very important that you remember, this is very important that you remember, sanitize your gloves between each step. This is a lipid envelope virus. Now that may not mean much to you, but it means a whole great deal to scientists. It is the easiest thing to inactivate. And what I mean by that is, is that as long as that protein envelope is interrupted, it cannot enter a live viable human cell, which basically means it's the easiest thing to inactivate. By the time your gloves are dry, your, your, uh, whatever was on your gloves has been inactivated. If you're looking at going to a higher level of PPE where you're wearing a PAPR or an N95, this again is the highest level. This was the SOP at the time that I served at Emory. I know there's a lot of things that changed between now and then, but I wanted to show you the differences between the highest level of PPE and the lowest level of PPE. Now, a lot of people are running out of personal protective equipment. I'm going to encourage you to do whatever you can to protect yourself um, in the way that you feel you need to. You should be empowered to do that. Now, I have created a video on donning and doffing for healthcare professionals. It is on a YouTube channel. If you look under Safer Behaviors, I see that. I appreciate you posting the Beaky Method, but it is on the YouTube channel as well for donning and doffing. And that gives you three scenarios, the highest level of donning and doffing, highest level of PPE, and then I go a little bit lower, and then I go to the lowest level. Now, when a lot of people are saying we don't have N95s or we're running out of N95s, listen, I know you're not going to see what I'm about ready to see in a published guideline. Quite honestly, we're in an emergency situation, so we have to start doing what we can do to the best of our ability. I would recommend, listen, do not dip your N95s in bleach. Do not dip your N95s in anything. Moisture is what destroys the filter. Please don't do that. If you want to just do a surface decon on a filter, you, you, you should use a chemical disinfectant that evaporates quickly so that the dampness doesn't damage the filter. So I am proposing a 70% aspect of ethanol or isopropyl. You spray it on the inside and the outside of the N95 and you reuse the one that you have. People are gonna say, Sean, there's no evidence to su support that. And I'm gonna say, you're absolutely right. But I will tell you this, the byproduct of bleach could be a carcinogen. I don't like when people are dipping it in chemicals, pulling it out and drying it off. Do not damage your N95s with liquid or with dampness. You want to use your N95s again. It's just a surface spray on the inside and on the outside and, uh, and go forward. And again, do I have science to back that up? Absolutely not. 
but I'm not concerned about the surfaces. If I can inactivate what's on the surface, I'm going to try and preserve what's on the filter, uh, meaning the filter, uh, uh, the stability of the filter. That's what I'm worried about. Okay. So again, very important that we look at that. What is the goal of the SOPs? Listen, safety is very important. It can't be just one person. We are a family. We are only as strong as our weakest link. By standardizing our practices around patients, we are going to ensure a standardized outcome. If we vary on our practices, then we get variable outcomes, and that also includes safety. So listen, again, ladies and gentlemen, very important. We have to standardize the practices of donning and doffing, needle sticks, cleaning up spills, waste management, even how we triage patients. All of this matters and should be standardized because if we don't standardize it and allow people to work uh, in the way that they see they should work, because they perceive risk completely differently, they're going to behave very differently around that risk as well. So it's very important that we understand that an SOP is two or more people doing the same thing the same way to achieve the same result. And again, I put a couple of, of SOPs that you can use when you're cleaning up a spill from a patient that may have gotten sick. Very important that you let everybody know that there's been a spill. You change your personal protective equipment so you don't track away the spill. Always clean the spill from outside in. Allow for appropriate contact time and always log and report the incident. Remember, we should be training not only the highest level professionals, but also the people that take care of the spaces as well and do cleanups in these environments. When you have a needle stick, should be a very clear uh, aspect as well. There should be a very clear plan. Expose the wound, flush the wound uh, for five minutes, cover the wound, doff normally, report for medical assessment, log and report the incident. Again, should have very clear plans. You should also make spill kits available. We have a lot of spill kits for, for chemical agents, but not for biological. I've put a painter's bucket because it's the best. It's again, what we did at Emory. We created these spill kits and we were very happy. I'm not going to break patient confidentiality because Dr. Um, Dr. Brantley wrote about this in his book, but the reality is, is that he was feeling so good uh, very early on in his treatment with Ebola that we got him a number one combo with a sweet tea from Chick-fil-A. And uh, he had just gotten back from West Africa. He was doing great and he was eating it. And halfway through it, he stood up and said, I gotta go to the bathroom now and boom, more diarrhea around the room and around the nurses than I've ever seen. And it's bloody diarrhea with Ebola, latent stage disease Ebola. So uh, we were very happy to have prepared and had those biological spill kits available, okay? Your isolation and evacuation, you should be considering what you're going to do to evacuate a patient in three different types of situations. Number one, you've got time. That's green, non-life threatening. Number two, you've got a nurse or a doctor that was working with a patient in the isolation unit and they passed out. How do you get them out of that room and decon them properly so there's not a breach of containment? And then number three, if the hospital is under attack, if there's a fire, if there's a reason you have to move a very infectious patient out of isolation and out of the hospital, how do you do it without allowing them to mix with general population? These challenges are very important and require planning, and I would strongly recommend that hospitals begin looking at that as well, okay? Now, very, very important concept to consider. Um, uh, it's neat. I taught this during the 2014 outbreak and prior to uh, the nurses uh, and doctors at Emory University. It is the glove removal process. It's called the Beaking Method. It's in the book that I published, and I put that step in here because one of the things that bothers me about the way that, that, that things are taken off right now is, and it's very important, very, very important that we understand, is that sometimes what will happen is we take off one glove and we use a finger to take off the other. The beaking method does not allow for this to happen. What it does is it keeps the glove on so that we're never taking a single finger and pushing it into a contaminated glove. So again, I would strongly recommend it. Please use it. In 2004, when we developed this beaking method, I really truly thought it was gonna be beneficial for laboratorians. But unfortunately, I've learned in the years, in the past years, especially with, with Ebola, and the two nurses that got sick uh, uh, during the Ebola case, and I had a chance to work directly with Nina Pham, who 
uh, won a lawsuit. To, uh, she was one of the nurses that got sick. The reality is, is that when you look, if you do a glow germ exercise and you coat your gloves with, with glow germ and you slide that single finger under that glove cuff, it's like you're self-inoculating and that index finger right into the cuticle of your fingernail and your skin. And, and I'm telling you, if you want to do it, use glow germ. If you want to use chocolate sauce, use chocolate sauce. It, in my opinion, it is absolutely um, horrible the way that we're teaching people to remove their gloves and do so in a way that could potentially contaminate their finger or their, their, their hands. So in the beaking method, we keep a glove on and we remove the glove using the beaking method, which doesn't expose the index finger or any skin uh, while, while we're doing that. And again, that, there's a video on, uh, on YouTube that shows the whole process. Again, always wash your hands uh, with soap and water. And, uh, and, and if you have any questions, you can always give me a call or let me know. <clears throat> Lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about leadership. I think it's very, very important that we have leaders get involved. Uh, uh, and I use a model, a uh, very, very clear uh, uh, a model called Leaders Care. But one thing that I want to stress is in times like this, it's very important that we support our, our, our workers. I mean, unbelievably, you do not punish them. If you choose to punish them, what's going to happen is they are going to begin to hide true behaviors. And we don't want that. We want people to be open and transparent about what's going on every single day to share what they're feeling and what they're thinking so that what they say they're doing, they're really doing. And I think that's very important for us to, uh, to actually begin promoting. And so when I say care, it's very important. When we provide resources, we always set expectations, but we ensure compliance and then again, hold people accountable to what those expectations are. And there's a lot of leadership controls. I know we're running out of time and I wanna be able to, uh, to, to wrap this up. When we, when we look at the general public, we have to develop systems that address fear, stigma, and denial. Uh, in the general public, people become afraid of what it is that, uh, that we're encountering. They begin to stigmatize anything associated with it and then like to deny all science. Whereas the pioneers, the healthcare workers, will deny uh, that their symptoms or something that they're feeling could potentially be uh, uh, the disease they're working with. No, no, I'm just tired or it's just allergies. And then when that doesn't go away and it starts to present more like the disease they're working with, they begin to fear it. And then they fear stigmatized or being stigmatized that they should have known better or should have done better. We have to develop systems that address both the public and the, uh, the public health professionals, okay? So what I'm going to do there is I know we're running out of time and I've obviously done too much. Uh, because we want to take some questions. But I really want to remind people that we've been here before. Uh, we've seen this type of outrage. We saw it with anthrax. We saw it with SARS. I mean, there's a, a classic example of using bras for filters. That was back in 2003. We saw it with H1N1. Is this swine flu? I mean, no, you're having an anxiety attack. Um, we saw it with Ebola. Uh, we're going to continue to see it with this as well. And I, again, I want to just make sure that, you know, that we remind people that we've been here before. Uh, we, will, uh, we will be here again, ladies and gentlemen. This will be something that we experience in the years to come as well. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I know uh, that we have lots of questions. I think, I think it's good to have Q&A now. And what I'll do is I'll end a little bit earlier, but last but not least, just talk about my last slide here. And I apologize that I, I had too much slides. I'm sorry, too many slides. Um, keep a right attitude right now. Um, by managing expectations. Uh, we are learning a lot. There's gonna be a lot of changes. And if your expectations are not met, you can become disappointed, which will have direct effects on your perceptions and your overall behaviors, how you perceive risk and how you respond to those risks. I'm gonna guarantee, I'm gonna ask you, manage those expectations. We're gonna see numbers surge. We're gonna see people we know get sick, okay? We're gonna see people we know possibly uh, pass away from this. And the reality is, is that when we take a look at managing our expectations, we need to be reasonable so that it doesn't affect how we look at the world and what we do in the world. And expectations are the greatest influence on attitudes. So control, again, control those expectations. Know we've got a lot of changes coming, a lot of new information is gonna come, and we will be personally touched by this disease by the end. 
So just make sure that you understand that that is coming and to manage those expectations properly. Okay. I think at this point, what I'm going to do is I will turn it over to Hudson and everyone who has the questions and we'll facilitate a QA. and a Perfect. Thank you very much, Sean. It looks like we have uh, several questions. So We do. You guys have asked some really good questions. What do you think of long lining IV tube to pumps outside of a patient, um, a, a COVID patient's room? Well, I, I think that there's potential patient safety impacts there um, because obviously it's, you know, it's, it's no different than if we're doing that with O2 lines. We're going to need increased pressure. So, you know, if you have the right setup, and I think Sean said some great graphics of how we can sort of set up the ideal scenario, that's, that's better. Um, the other thing that I would think about too is if your patient is in a negative pressure room and you've got IV lines going through the door, and the door is shut on the IV lines, then are you either kinking the line or are you creating a crack um, in that negative pressure environment? So, you know, there, we really should have those in the room if we can. Uh, from a medical perspective, it's gonna, you know, create a little bit better scenario for us, but I understand the rationale behind that. I don't know, Sean, if you wanna add anything on that. No, I think that's good. I mean, from a medical point of view, I think you've got that. Um, I think the other part we need to add to that, Hudson, is we always need to check the IV site as well. To make sure we're not causing a complication. So yeah, because if you if you document in the electronic health record that you did your assessment through the window, I think the uh, litigation attorneys are going to probably uh, pounce for sure. I think so too. So how are patients classified as recovered, or do they recover clinically, or are they having a retest that comes back negative? So most patients are not being retested. There's really no need. So once they're asymptomatic, um, afebrile, those types of things, they would be classified as recovered after the incubation time period. So I think that right now the, the, the guidelines, and I think this is important for everybody, CDC is recommending 14 days post onset of symptoms. And, and, and I, I do wanna point out, Lancet has a great paper uh, out right now. If you go to Lancet resource area right now, it's called, um, the paper is actually called Prolonged Presence of SARS coronavirus viral RNA and fecal samples. And I think that this is absolutely critical because the reality is, is that when you look at that statement, even though CDC is recommending 14 days uh, post onset, um, if you are gonna have healthcare workers return uh, after 14 days, uh, keep in mind that it is present in fecal samples up to, I mean, I think the paper citing up to 30 or 40 days so you may want to make sure that if they do go to the restroom and primarily use, you know, go <laughs> defecate, number two, uh, they're going to want to focus on good hand hygiene before returning to the workforce. Very good. Thanks. So I think I'm going to bring Blake in to ask a few questions for us as well. Blake, you there? I am. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Judy. Uh, so the next question here is, there's a lot of discussion and miscommunication regarding daily use of the N95 mask and reuse versus extended use. If, patient, if a patient has no symptoms, uh, then is a surgical mask adequate protection or should all healthcare providers be wearing an N95 mask in daily patient care? Well, I unfortunately saw this this weekend where I went into an emergency department and the day before everybody was wearing a surgical mask and then they suddenly switched to everybody wearing N95 um, because they had a patient with suspected corona that turned out to be negative. So I, I wanna pose the question this way. Do we wear an N95 every time we have respiratory illnesses? Do we wear an N95 every time we have flu or anything like that? And the answer is no. So it really doesn't make a lot of sense to me to wear an N95 for patient care that's not gonna involve people that are symptomatic, that's not gonna involve aerosols and really preserve. And if you look at the CDC guidance, they specifically call that out to preserve N95s and those, those level respirators for aerosol producing procedures. So our respiratory therapists, our anesthesiologist, our anesthetist, um, certainly EMS professionals that are doing NEB treatments, things like that, that's really where you're gonna see the biggest bang for your buck. Um, so there's really no, no, no reason in my mind to be walking around wearing an N95. I think, you know, from my perspective, one thing, this is where, where we can really be a little bit smarter with, with what we're doing. I, I, I don't believe that there is a, a risk, no risk. I think that if you take a look at red, green, and yellow, uh, red is somebody who is symptomatic, fits the clinical presentation of a case, 
you obviously, rather than everybody wearing a mask as a healthcare provider, you put the masks on the people that are red. Um, and, and, and not necessarily an N95, but contain what they have within their nose and their mouth with red patients. When you look at yellow patients, these are patients that um, uh, may have uh, uh, symptoms or may not, but have been around people that are known illness. Um, why they're even presenting and close to healthcare providers is, is beyond me. They should be triaged away. You should not be allowed in a hospital right now if you're asymptomatic and demanding to get a test. That, because you're looking at, the, if you look at super spreaders from MERS, there was a case that was a beautiful example, uh, 80 people from one person in a healthcare setting. And if, you, and if you look at it, it was simply because this person was being touched by multiple healthcare providers and screened by multiple healthcare providers rather than just limiting the number of contact points this person had and using spatial aspects to minimize disease transmission. So I think that when you look at a green, yellow, red, you can develop policies, practices in your triage and screening procedures that are gonna not only minimize your personal protective equipment use, but you're also gonna be minimizing patient contact with healthcare workers. So I think there's a lot to think about. There's a lot of strategies that can be put in place. Awesome. Uh, so here's another question. Uh, in regards to the self-made mask, which we saw a good example in the slides there, isn't it more dangerous to do that because of the false sense of security? Um, what's your view about reusing masks? Uh, so my, my answer to that is absolutely not. Let me explain uh, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, reusing masks, we're in uncharted territory. Actually, we're not. There's a lot of countries worldwide to the third uh, uh, you know, uh, they're, you know, lower SES aspects, they're what we would consider under-resourced countries who have been using PPE for, uh, reusing PPE for a long time. W one of the things I, I want to empower people to do is if you've got nothing, something is better than nothing. So, uh, so you're absolutely right in saying that, well, do we produce a false sense of security? Well, yes and no. I mean, if you're going to tell me to work around a patient that is classically symptomatic with no respirator protection, and, and I'm gonna try and do something rather than nothing, then I'm going to say something is better than nothing. Um, I think that anybody who's trying to be creative in solving this problem is probably going in under the impression that this is not ideal, it's not perfect. I'm, I'm doing the best that I can to protect myself. What do you want me to do, nothing? So I think that from a psychological point of view, we need to empower our providers to take control of their safety and their health and to do what they think they need to do, especially if they are under-resourced and are looking at a situation where they don't have what they need to, to work safely around infectious patients. I don't know, if, uh, Dr. Hudson, you wanna add anything to that? No, I mean, it, again, it goes back to that risk-benefit analysis. And if you, you know, would I wanna reuse necessarily a surgical mask for a week? No, and N95, I might be able to get a lot more use out of. So. Again, I think think about the risk that you're going to be undertaking. Screen your patients appropriately. Good triage is really, really helpful here. And then also think about other controls that you might be able to add, like a negative pressure room. So if I have a patient, again, that is, I've got source control in their mask, that's going to give me a lot more protection than if I'm the only one masked. So we want, really want to mask both individuals um, in this setting. I also will say that I walked into a hospital in the greater Atlanta area and they make every single person walking in, whether they come in by foot or by ambulance, wear a mask. Um, you could be coming in for a trauma and you have to wear a mask, which again, I think to Sean's point, does that really make the most sense for our PPE utilization or should we really try to prioritize these patients? And I, I think you could go back to a sort of a pediatrician model where you have sort of a sick waiting room and a, and a healthy waiting room. And as we screen these patients more appropriately, um, and again, that comes with good triage, we might be able to sort of root out some of those issues um, that way as well. Excellent. Uh, probably a very pertinent question to those in vascular access here. Uh, what should be worn when placing a PICC line for a positive patient? And the question goes on, there is concern with using the PAPR and uh, maybe the continuous air purified respirator um, and the air flow contaminating the sterile field uh, versus the N95 getting hot if worn for more than an hour? Any... Yeah, I think that's a very reasonable question. I mean, I, I personally always like to go with what's most comfortable. So for me, I love a PAPR. Um, that's just my own personal preference. If I have a PAPR, I'm always going to choose a PAPR. 
Um, if I don't have that, my next level of protection would be an N95. Um, I've, I've worn an N95 this past weekend for 14 hours in a row. So it, it is definitely uncomfortable, but I would rather have that highest level of respiratory protection um, and sort of be equipped for that if I can. Um, I wouldn't be you know, necessarily tremendously concerned about the airflow. Um, I think that's, you know, we can't control the air in a situation anyway, even in an operating room, we don't have total control over the air. So that to me would be very low on the totem pole. So I don't know if you want to add anything on no, that. I think that we do the best that we can. If you're concerned about droplets or, or directional air, remember fans can, are a very cheap way of, of, of doing things. And again, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you know, the fact that handkerchiefs are bad for healthcare professionals. And I, I want to do two things here. I want to highlight the fact that, well, something's better than nothing, if that's all you've got. But, you know, a lot of people aren't talking about the fact that handkerchiefs are actually a good thing for patients. And if you don't have masks and you go, you know, my daughter, I love this, she has hair bands. And all the, you know, these uh, hair bands, I don't know what they're called, but, you know, she wears them around her head. You can take that and put that around a patient's nose and mouth. And what you're doing is you may not be able to stop, quote unquote, all the uh, aerosolized, evaporated droplet germs from going through an unregistered uh, HEPA filtered mask. But what you're doing by making a patient wear that, and it's easy to breathe through, is you're controlling droplets that are projected when they're coughing or talking. And so again, you know, a lot of people are talking about this black and white. It's either good or bad. Well, look, we're at a point right now where, you know, stop saying we can't use something unless it's the absolute proven best technology. Because what's that, what that's doing is it's hurting humans from being creative and developing something that's better than nothing. And so again, you know, consider saving the surgical masks and the N95s for the healthcare workers, using them appropriately, but using things like hair bands and, and things that will allow patients to cover their nose and their mouth to control for droplet transmission. So in, in a previous webinar, we talked about disinfecting ultrasound machines. And I think really the question here is about what is the best way to protect our um, ultrasound machine and disinfect it in the COVID environment? So I think as Sean mentioned, that the virus itself is very readily inactivated on environmental surfaces, which is an awesome thing, right? So there is the EPA list, um, which uh, are included in the slide references that you can click on and find your uh, EPA registered hospital grade disinfectant. For cleaning and disinfection, you can use the same thing. Um, all we're simply saying is that if you have any type of bio burden or soil present on the device itself, that you should clean it prior to disinfection. But there are, you know, over 100 products that are commercially available right now that EPA has deemed effective against COVID-19. Um, so that would be where I would, I would go for that. And again, you should have access to one or more of those products within your facility. Um, you know, the only other thing I would add is that you'd want to consult with the manufacturer to make sure that whatever you use, for example, bleach is highly, you know, corrosive in some um, devices versus other products that might be a little bit less irritating, but you can always uh, contact the manufacturer and they can give you guidance on what's been approved. Excellent. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what are your thoughts on the use of hydrochloroquine for COVID treatment? I didn't buy stock in the company, if that helps. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, once again, there's anecdotal evidence out there that that works. Um, we've seen anecdotal evidence regarding Tamiflu and some other things as well. Without true randomized controlled trials, it's hard to say with complete scientific certainty. But as Sean mentioned, we also don't want to get in the way of, we don't want to be perfect and let that get in the way of sort of experimentation with these patients. If we can find good solutions, we should use them, especially if it's things that we have on the shelf in large quantities that can allow us to do that. But I know FDA is working aggressively um, to have those conversations too. I'm just going to speak about a white elephant in the room, and 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 I think there is. I I. You know, to 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 have a drug, and there's not much that, that I understand. I've talked to a lot of my colleagues who are high-level virologists, and this is a science thing again. There are two types of antivirals out there. There are antivirals that in uh, that boost an immune system, which we don't want to be prescribing, but there are antivirals that truly, truly prevent the replication of viral cells. And I have absolutely no clue why 
No one is talking about antivirals. And by the way, just so you know, there is extensive evidence with MERS and SARS in vitro and in clinical aspects that there's great benefits to antivirals. So I, I, it, it baffles me. I have absolutely, I mean, we're looking at antibiotics and, and, and something that treats a parasitic infection and we're not mentioning antivirals. I don't know, maybe we're trying to preserve something, but why people aren't bringing up antivirals that have shown clinical uh, 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 and in vitro uh, effectiveness, uh, it blows me away. I have no clue. I don't know, Dr. Hudson, you know why they're not talking about antivirals? I think a lot of it's politics, unfortunately. Yeah, well, so, I, I, you know, if we, again, that makes sense. Yeah, if we've got anecdotal evidence, it's better than no evidence. Yeah. And especially, you know, I think all too often, and especially government agencies that use the grade sort of methodology to rank guidelines, and if they don't have enough RCTs, they don't ever mention it, or they say it's inconclusive. Um, or not recommended. And, and when we have good clinical practice experience, especially across the world and mul multiple geographies that are telling us that this is improving the quality of care for the patients and that sort of end outcome, then it's definitely something we should take a look at. I don't think any option should be off the table. Um, and, you know, it goes back to sort of the old days of penicillin where it went away for a while and now it's come back. There's a lot of things that we probably have in our arsenal right now that can be helpful. Um, to combat this as well as other viral pathogens that we're experiencing in the future. Excellent. Uh, so here's a question. If you get COVID-19 and then quarantine yourself for the 14 days, uh, how high is the risk uh, to get reinfected once you come back as it is predicted to go on for months? I, what we're seeing evidence-wise is there was a paper out of China that suggested that there could have been reinfection of individuals. Uh, that paper, though, has since been uh, clarified or, or been uh, readdressed as more evidence would have to suggest before the author could come to that conclusion. We are not at this point believing that uh, once you are infected and your body builds an immunity to this virus, that reinfection um, with, that is symptomatic and includes viral shedding occurs at this point. A lot of unknown still. That's a very tough question to address, and there's not a lot of science that backs that up. But from what we can tell is there was a paper out of China that indicated a little bit earlier that maybe healthcare workers were getting reinfected, but that has been cleared up a little bit as to the healthcare workers never really tested positive. It could have been influenza. We don't necessarily know, and there's no evidence that suggests at this point that reinfection, uh, meaning you've gained an immunity to this virus, you come back, you get sick again, and you begin shedding virus. There's no science yet that backs that up. A lot that we still don't know, but a lot that we do. And so we still need a little bit more time to, uh, to, to assess that. Awesome. Um, any insight on, now we got several questions on this, which is really regarding reusing PPE. Um, we kind of touched on that. Uh, is there any other highlights that we can add uh, to that piece of the conversation? A lot of people are mentioning that they're running out of supplies and uh, kind of looking for guidance. I would, I would take, look, I take a three-step approach. And the first approach that I would take is I would use distancing um, and proper triage strategies to minimize personal protective equipment usage. That's number one. Number two, I would begin to separate uh, yellow, red, and green patients so that we know proper PPE can be assigned to healthcare providers who truly need it, meaning N95s are for the sickest patients, uh, surgical masks are for the yellow patients, and again, a face shield would be ample for, uh, for a green patient. Um, lastly, uh, the, the last thing that I would do is if you're going to reuse your gear, make sure that what you're doing to reuse it doesn't attack the integrity of the filter and offers uh, a good surface decontamination of things that could have touched the outer and inner parts of that mask. And again, my recommendation is a chemical that evaporates quickly, which will not dampen the filter. And that means I would not dip it in anything. I would not wash it in anything. I would simply do a surface spray down of something, a chemical that evaporates, and bleach is not one that evaporates. Most of them don't. That's why I would recommend the 70% alcohol uh, aspect, and I would recommend a surface decon of that filter. Again, unproven, so please don't be telling, but if you're looking at reusing and wanting to decon, I think a, a chemical that evaporates quickly 
and inactivates the agent as a reasonable uh, a solution. I don't know. Excellent. And I'll say uh, the last question here, uh, Hudson, uh, you spoke about droplet size and face mask barrier. Uh, what size droplet is the COVID-19 compared to others, large or small? So when we think about the difference between the sizes, so when we think about airborne precautions, we're trying to have that, that tighter filter, if you will. Um, so the reason that CDC has recommended that is due to aerosolization. It's not necessarily due to uh, general transmission. So a regular surgical mask for a patient that is not um, receiving any type of aerosolization procedure would be fine. I don't know, Sean, if you want to ask or add anything well, different. Well, I, I think that the, the, here's the, so in laboratories, we break up containment levels uh, called one, two, three, and four. And containment levels uh, with uh, level three are agents that are spread through routes of aerosol like brucella, Bacillus anthracis, anthrax, uh, uh, Francisella tularam tularamia. Uh, we have uh, plague. Um, all these pathogens, uh, tuberculosis, all these pathogens are breathed into the mouth and deep into the lungs, which cause pulmonary infections. This is something very unique. It's different. It's not being breathed into the lungs. It's actually hitting mucous membranes like eyes and your nose and your mouth. And so, again, I think that when we look at aerosolization, the word is semantically being split here. Someone exposes or, or coughs out a droplet before it hits the ground, it evaporates, and now they find remnants in the air. Um, the, the question is, is if we have a protective barrier in front of our mucous membranes, is that enough with this disease? I believe it is, um, but I think more evidence is needed uh, to suggest uh, otherwise. Uh, we see there's a great paper out with influenza that talks about it has a, uh, healthcare associated infections with nurses that wear N95s versus nurses that wear surgical masks. And in a clinically controlled trial where it looks at HAIs, there was no statistical difference between a nurse that wore a mask and a nurse that wore an N95 with influenza. And we believe this disease kind of operates very similar ways uh, when we talk about aerosolization. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Dr. Hudson. I think he's gonna bring us out. Perfect. So I uh, appreciate all the questions and just a couple of conclusions that we wanna remind everybody of is that this is yet another opportunity to standardize our practices. So going back to sort of the CLAPSI bundle and uh, the, the bundles that IHI did many years ago where we standardized our central line um, approaches both for insertion as well as care. This is yet another example of that. How do we make sure we hardwire that? We also recognize that there's some simple things that we can do as vascular access professionals that will not only keep the patient safer, but also prevent potential occupational exposure. We don't want anybody to go home with this. We don't want everybody to have you know, to be quarantined or anything like that. And again, it's an opportunity for us to be reminded of the importance of our work, but also the, the sort of critical um, attention to detail that we need to have. The basic things that we need to focus on, right, are prevention and screening, hand hygiene, the use of PPE as appropriate, and then keeping our clinical environment of care clean and disinfected. And when we think about PPE, don't overuse, don't underutilize, and work with your value analysis team, your engineers, your infection preventionist, and your risk managers to come up with a PPE system that's gonna be effective for you, that's gonna meet the needs of your, your patients. You're never gonna be faulted for going to a higher level of PPE if that's what you have access to, but we wanna conserve that in this very difficult time for all of us as healthcare professionals. And lastly, you know, every outbreak comes with, again, that opportunity for learning. If we pass by that opportunity, then we have completely, completely missed out. Um, there are so many things that we could be learning as healthcare institutions, and while the federal government, you know, publishes papers and publishes guidelines. Each of us as healthcare professionals that works in vascular access and also as a facility, we need to figure out what worked well, what didn't work well, what can we do differently next time so that we can prepare for that next pandemic that might come. You know, every time that we, we endure one of these, it's, it's something that we need to learn and we need to, you know, hunker down and actually find better practices that are going to be able to be readily implemented in a rapid fashion. That's really important. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Judy for some closing remarks. Um, and we do include the, the reference again to the CDC website, as well as the references for today's program. Sean and Hudson, thank you so much. This was a great program. I appreciate both of the, the expertise that you guys bring to this. And um, again, thank you. This was a wonderful, really informative webinar. Again, um, other things for you to know, we all, because 
a lot of us don't have those meetings to go to right now where you can get the education um, we generally get at our network meetings. We are hosting webinars almost every week at this point, and sometimes two. This week, we also have another webinar with Lee Steer is gonna to talk to us about lean technology and one stick success, what it does for his institution. And that's on Wednesday. These are free webinars. We hope to see you there. Stay safe out there and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye now.